and thanks for inviting me to speak. So I'm Ian Harry. I work at the University of Portsmouth. I've worked within the LIGO collaboration for 10 years now, roughly. So it's been nice to go from <coughs> eight or so years of we're never going to see anything, when are your detectors going to be good enough to see stuff, through to the last three years where we've really seen gravitational wave astronomy blossom. And it's been a really nice uh, change in pace, I think, for a, a lot of us that have, that have been through that. So I, I want to sort of focus today really on the methods that we use to actually observe the um, compact binary mergers in the data. And I'll leave uh, Vivian later, we'll talk a little bit, uh, and Sarah, following Vivian, we'll talk a bit about what happens after that. Um, I'll just focus on the question of how do we actually make the observations. So, so just to give a, a brief outline of what I'm going to say, I'll start with a, a little bit of introduction. Um, and then I'll try to do this um, from, from a, maybe a, a sort of maybe a pedantic way of looking at this. So I'll try to say a little bit about what are we assuming about the signal when we do these searches? What are, we, what are the things that we use when going in? What do we assume about the noise? What does our data look like? And how do we use this information? And then how is all of this tied together to perform an actual search for, for compact binary mergers? And I'll end by talking a little bit about some of the unmodeled searches that are, that are also used um, to try to observe compact binary mergers. So, it's worth reminding that there's always a bigger picture here. It isn't, we've spoken a lot about compact binary mergers at this meeting, but it's about a lot more than that. Just like with the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, yeah, the gravitational wave spectrum spans a large number of frequencies going back from very low frequency signals arising from, say, quantum fluctuations in the early universe through to binary supermassive black holes uh, it, that might happen during galactic mergers, through to the sort of compact binary mergers that we're seeing today, um, and maybe neutron stars orbiting in our galaxy, um, white dwarf binaries and things like that. So hopefully if someone's given a talk like this in 10 or so years' time, you'll be able to hear about numerous different sources that we've observed to date. And potentially even by the time we get to, say, 2030 or so, with, with a variety of different... Um, instruments as well. You can sort of see how old this slide is because it gives Lisa at 2010 rather than 2030, which shows that this slide may have been around a, a little while now and probably need some updating. Um, but we really, really to, to emphasize that there is a spectrum of different things that we are hoping to be observing in the next 10 or 20 <coughs> years. Um, of course, the focus here really is on, on compact binary mergers as it has been with the other talks to date. So. Um, really we'll just discuss the methods that are used to observe these sources. Although a lot of the techniques that we will cover today and demonstrate also in the tutorials are also applicable in, in other areas. The techniques that we use here are similar to those that are used to observe rotating neutron stars in our galaxy or to observe um, white, dwarf, white dwarf binaries with something like LISA. Um, the, the, there's a lot of crossover between the methods used. Um, so I should also say that there are a number of different search algorithms that are currently being used to try to observe colliding compact mergers. Um, three of these methods use templated searches, which means that we rely directly on the predicted waveform models that Ed has just introduced. Um, there's three different codes with various silly names that we use to do this. Um, there's also a non-templated search code which does not rely on waveform models that is also targeting compact binary mergers. And, and the argument here is that what if we do see something that doesn't quite match the type of predictions that we have, um, this maybe provides a backup and might also allow us to observe something different if such an event might happen. My personal expertise has been in one of the, um, one of the primary developers of the PI-CBC pipeline, which is highlighted here. So the methods that we'll discuss and also the tutorials that we'll go over later will focus on, on this method. Um, it's very similar to, to the ideas that are used in the other cases, and I can talk a little bit more about the differences if anyone's interested to come and talk to me over coffee or during the tutorial session. Um, but at least we'll focus specifically on the approach that PiCBC uses to try to observe compact binary mergers. Okay, so, so let's try and go through a little bit about the grounding then. So what, what are the things that we need coming in to do the search? So the first thing I want to talk about, which covers a little bit of some of the stuff that, that Ed already talked about, so I'll, I'll try to not spend time discussing things that have already been discussed, but let's talk a little bit about what do we know about the signal. So as Ed has described, 
there's basically an industry in the field at the moment trying to generate accurate models for compact binary mergers, which really come at this from two directions. Um, we firstly have the approximate analytical solutions, the post-Newtonian expansion, and also the effective one-body approach, um, and there's a bunch of references if anyone wants to read a bit more about this, um, are used to sort of model analytically the in-spiral portion of the waveform. All of these approximations break down, though, as the two black holes become close to the merger, and you really need the full general relativity equations to model what's happening. Um, to solve this, we use numerical relativity, where you basically model two black holes in a numerical code, and you evolve them in time and make the black holes go around each other. Um, these are computationally expensive. It's very difficult to model a large number of orbits doing this, um, but they can model the collision and the subsequent ring down of the black holes very accurately. Although it is always worth highlighting that there is some inaccuracy in these numerical approaches as well. They are doing a stepwise integration, and that will lead to some numerical errors that is often overlooked when discussing these things. So nothing's perfect, but these things are still very good. Um, so the waveforms that we've generated, um, we've already seen some examples of these. Let me just throw, throw them up again. Um, these are the types of waveforms that we've been using to observe compact binary mergers. And of course, we should highlight again that we don't know exactly the waveform that are, we would be given off because compact binary mergers are described by a large set of parameters. As, as Ed discussed, even if we're considering binary black holes orbiting on circular orbits, you need 15 parameters to describe the system, um, covering both the masses of the two objects, the angular momenta of the two black holes, and the angles describing where and how the, orient the observer is oriented with respect to the source that are being observed. So in total, 15 parameters if you're considering two black holes on circular orbits. Add in two more if you want to consider the possibility that they're eccentric. Add in n more if you want to consider the possibility that these are neutron stars modeled by a complex equation of state. Add in m more if you want to consider that they might be some black hole mimicker or some other exotic theory, or if you've got some non-GR theory, then you can keep adding parameters however you want. Um, so just to give a sense of sort of how this might vary the waveform, and I apologize that my uh, animation skills are very poor, hence credit. Um, I'm, I'm going to start here just showing three waveforms being emitted from three different systems. Um, these three systems have two black holes that start at the same distance apart from each other, and they have the same masses. Um, we're going to the blue trace that's shown here. The two black holes are Schwarzschild black holes. They don't have any angular momentum. Um, the green trace, I've chosen two black holes which have angular momentum, which is aligned in the direction of the orbit. And for the red case, I've chosen two black holes, again with angular momentum, which is misaligned with the orbit. And in this latter case, this misalignment will cause the plane of the orbit to process as the system evolves. Um, so if we set our highly technical animation going, there we go, um, you can see that as we start this playing, you can immediately see the effect of the emitted gravitational wave from the red system. And the procession here is causing the amplitude of the emitted signal to change very rapidly. But we can also see the effect between the blue and the green, that a phase shift is starting to develop between the two um, as the spin of the black holes affects the phase evolution of the emitted system. And this continues to evolve until, firstly, the blue and the red systems merge and stop. Um, we haven't included a merger in these waveforms, so they stop abruptly. And then a little bit later, the, the green trace stops as well. Um, now, this is interesting. What it actually shows is that the presence of this spin actually causes the, a hang-up effect. It takes longer for the black holes to actually merge with each other than in the case that they don't have spin. So this system actually would emit more energy than the blue system, which also gives us an observational bias. Where, as this is emitting more power, we can see it more easily than we can see a system that, that doesn't have spins. So we also have observational biases as well. Some systems are easier for us to see than others. Um, so I try to avoid nasty equations, but here's one that I feel is important in order to fully understand how the searches work. So here's the generic description of the signal models that we are trying to observe. And you can fit pretty much any theory you want into here. So we start really describing the gravitational wave signal that's emitted in the source. And this is done by writing the gravitational wave signal as a sum of a variety of modes. Um, these are spherical, spherical harmonics, if you want. Um, and these are basically are described as an amplitude 
uh, and a phase which evolve with time for each of these modes. These can, this can be obtained, for example, with numerical relativity or through the post-Newtonian expansion. Um, to predict the plus and cross polarization of a gravitational wave that will be emitted in any given direction, you need to sum these different modes uh, multiplied with the spherical harmonics, which correspond to which direction the uh, gravitational wave has been emitted in. And then from here, to go to the gravitational wave signal that an observer would see, you need to then include the uh, antenna patterns of the detector and multiply these by the, uh, the, the gravitational wave polarizations that are emitted. Um, now, of course, all of this is, is assuming general relativity, so this gets more complicated if you want to include some of these tensor modes or things like that. Um, but if you don't believe, if you do believe in GR, or at least believe it's good enough that we're not really going to be able to detect the difference, this is the generic signal model uh, that we use. Um, and I think it's important to go here because we can't use this directly, and there are some assumptions we need to make, and it's worth pointing this out and then pointing out what assumptions we need to make um, and what things, what parts of this we actually need to drop when we're actually performing the search. So if I was to do some sort of take-home points with regards to the signal models that we use, um, developing, I'd say development and improving compact binary signal modeling is, is a really large field of research at the moment, and it's made extremely rapid progress in the last 20 years. I think the first binary black hole merger was made within the last 20 years. Um, to be able to get to the point now where we have numerical relativity design waveforms that cover a very broad parameter space has been a very rapid progress there. And these current waveform models are good enough for most purposes for gravitational wave astronomy today, although they will need to improve as the sensitivity of our detectors improves as well. Um, but it's worth pointing out that there are still areas for improvement and areas where our gravitational wave models are not yet maybe perfect. For example, systems with high mass ratios, say neutron star black holes or one where a case where one black hole is particularly heavier than another. Maybe if you have cases where the spins are misaligned with the orbit, modeling this sort of processional dynamics is complicated. Um, cases where the black hole spins are, are very large, so very close to the Kerr limit. Um, also cases where you might want to consider exotic objects or if they aren't black holes at all or if you want to describe non-general relativity waveforms. Th these are also areas where perhaps the waveforms are not as good as the standard cases that we, we have at the moment. So to shift gear then from the signal model, I also want to introduce what we understand about the noise before trying to talk about the search itself. So, so let me say a few things about what we know or what we assume about the noise. So one thing that was already covered yesterday is the noise curves or the sensitivity bands of the instrument. Um, so here I show frequency as a function of strain, and I think we've seen plots like this before. These noise curves are, are quite complex, as well as a sort of broad bucket-like sensitivity curve given by shot noise, um, thermal noise, and seismic noise. We also have a large number of lines or combs in the, in the spectrum caused by various harmonics, the power lines, the uh, calibration lines, etc. Um, all of this means that we have quite a complex noise curve that we have to both accurately measure to be able to do what follows um, and to be able to, 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 to accurately make the, the searches work. I in addition to this, the sensitivity of the detectors is not constant. So here's a plot showing the, um, the angle average range, so, so the average range at which we could observe binary neutron stars as a function of time for the first um, observing run of the advanced detectors. And you can clearly see that this sensitivity is, is highly varying. Um, there's a sort of broad changing, but also very local dips. There's a number of points where the range drops dramatically. So we have to be able to deal with the fact that the sensitivity of the instruments is not constant and is changing with time. So this also means that not only are the noise curves complex, they're also changing as a function of time. Um, and the final feature of data which has been highlighted yesterday and is important to highlight again is that our data is not Gaussian, um, which is the match filtering is very nice in Gaussian noise and as we'll see struggles a little bit when it's not. Um, here's some example of instrumental artifacts or glitches that might occur or have occurred in the um, 01 observing run. And you can see that these take very different forms from sort of arches through to things that 
might sort of look a little bit like compact binary mergers um, or even something like this one here. Uh, so there's lots of different sources of these and, and trying to understand, remove these from the data is, is, is also a, a field of a lot of ongoing effort. Um, so just to summarize this again, our noise curves are complex. They have many lines over a broadband sensitivity. The LIGO sensitivity is highly non-stationary, um, maybe a little less so for Virgo, which tends to be uh, somewhat more stable than the two LIGO instruments. And instrumental artifacts or glitches appear regularly in the data, and something that we definitely need to worry about. So let's move on from there then, and, and let's start to actually talk about the detection problem itself. So how do we actually go about searching for, for binary black holes? How does this work? Um, so uh, let me just lay out the problem again then. We basically, we know what we're looking for. We know what compact binary mergers look like. We have these waveforms that model them. Um, these signals will be buried in detector data, which might look something like this. Um, can you see the signal? There is one in there. Of course it's there, um, as you can clearly, could clearly see on the last slide. This is basically an illustration of the problem that we're trying to solve. This is, this is basically um, how we're trying, this is what we're trying to do. Now, this would be okay if you knew exactly the signal you're looking for and your data is Gaussian and stationary. As Ed already explained, match filtering is the optimal method for looking for a known signal in stationary Gaussian noise where you know the noise curve, where you know the, the spectral density. Um, and just to sort of lay out what each of these things are, so you've got your template going in here, your data's there, and the noise curve is here. And this is basically as simple as you multiply the template by the data and weight by the sensitivity as a function of frequency. There really is nothing complicated in the match filter. It is as simple as multiply two things together and weight by the sensitivity curve. Um, if you do this as a function of time on our data with a signal in it, um, you can see that this match filter, which we can normalize to be a signal-to-noise ratio, as a function of time, has a nice peak here, um, which is presumably due, due to this signal. It also has another peak here, which is due to an, an instrumental artifact that is just happened to be there a few seconds later. Um, but at least from something like this, we'd be saying, well, there's a pretty good chance that there's actually something real here in this data with a signal-to-noise ratio as, as large as this. Now, the other thing that we really need to worry about, though, is that we don't know exactly what the waveform looks like because we're trying to deal with this 15-dimensional parameter space. Now, ideally, we would try to perform our match filter over this 15-dimensional parameter space, generate waveforms covering this full possible space of signals, and then someone will tell me 15 dimensions isn't enough because we need neutron stars, let's make it 17 dimensions, then let's include eccentricity and make it 19. Um, 15 dimensions isn't computationally feasible. We, we cannot search directly over a 15-dimensional parameter space. It doesn't work. Um, we do need some way to reduce the size of the parameter space um, before we can perform this match filtering operation. And, and this requires us to make a couple of assumptions about the signal to be able to do this. So let's walk through what those assumptions are. Um, and maybe you can tell me why this is silly or why we're missing the most important signals. Um, but let me at least try to motivate what we do. So the first assumption that we make in the search is we assume that there's no precession of the orbital plane. So we assume that if the black holes have any spin, it must be aligned in the same direction as the orbit. It can be aligned with the orbit or it can be anti-aligned with the orbit, although the latter case may not make that much scientific sense if you're not including these types of systems. Um, the basic idea for this assumption is that even if the signals do have misaligned spins, they will look sufficiently like a signal or a system that does not, that will find them anyway. And there are a number of papers that have explored this problem. And we generally find that unless you're considering quite high mass ratio systems, say, for example, a neutron star black hole, and it has quite an unfavorable configuration, we have a pretty good chance of finding it. Certainly for the types of binary black holes that we've observed to date, it doesn't appear that for the noise curves we have at the moment, that this assumption is really hurting the number of detections that we're making. The second assumption that we make is we assume that both bodies are black holes. So even when we're searching for neutron stars, 
we do not include any neutron star physics in the waveforms that we're using as templates. We are just assuming that they are very low mass black holes. Um, we also assume that both the bodies are on circular orbits, so we assume that there's no eccentricity in the system, and this does mean that for cases, if the eccentricity can be very high, we might miss them. Luckily, the emission of gravitational radiation will cause systems to lose any eccentricity as they evolve, and the chance of a system having residual eccentricity by the time we're able to observe it is, is quite low. The, the next assumption is we, we, we sort of wrote out these equations before about how systems have all these modes of gravitational wave content. When doing the search, we only consider the, the dominant mode, the, the, the leading quadrupole component to the gravitational wave emission. We do not include any other subdominant modes when performing the search. Um, if the reason for making all of these assumptions is not only the fact that we've directly removed a number of the parameters because we've pretended that the spins have to be aligned with the orbit and there's no eccentricity, we've also made it such that the orientation and location parameters, the various angles that decide where it is on the sky, etc., can all be parameterized as either a constant amplitude shift or a constant phase shift. So all of the, any, the two masses and the two angular momenta of the black holes affect how the system evolves, and these appear here. Everything else, all the other angles, just enter here as a constant phase shift or here as a constant amplitude shift now. So we've almost reduced this to a four-dimensional problem. To sort of complete this, we can say, OK, here's my match filter signal-to-noise ratio. If I maximize this over these orientation and location parameters, that's easy. I can just take the, the absolute value of this. Um, they've gone. And I can also express this as a function of the coalescence time just by using um, a principle of Fourier transforms by pulling the time off here. And now I can evaluate this quickly using an inverse Fourier transform. So in this way, I can reduce the problem to a four-dimensional one, just searching over the two masses and the two angular momenta of the components. We don't have any nice trick to deal with this. We just have to brute force the problem and create a large set of filter waveforms that will cover this full four-dimensional parameter space so that we would be able to recover any type of system that might exist anywhere that we're searching. Um, this is called a template bank, and here's sort of an example of this. Here are two masses, and there's a whole bunch of dots here which correspond to individual waveforms that you might need to filter the data to, to observe these systems. For higher mass systems, the waveforms are shorter, and you need a sort of less dense set of filter waveforms to be able to cover things. Down for binary neutron stars, you need quite a dense set of waveforms to be able to cover the, the full set of space that you're searching. Um, and we try to create this such that um, even for signals that might lie here, sort of in the gap, we wouldn't lose more than about 3% of the signal power when performing our search. Um, and there's a number of different methods that we use to try to create these banks, and this is another area. Um, I could probably talk for quite a bit more on this, but I've only got 40 minutes. But if someone wants to understand this process a little better, I'm more than happy to sort of talk through um, how we generate these kind of banks um, in four dimensions, which I can't really plot here either. And that would basically be the end of the story if our data were Gaussian. Um, unfortunately, it's not. So if it was Gaussian, we could pretty much get the mathematics out. We could figure out the significance of any peak analytically. What does it mean if I got a signal-to-noise ratio of 80? I just need to figure out how many trials factors I've got and normalize correctly. Um, that's, not, that's not trivial, but we could do it. Um, but the data is not Gaussian and non-Gaussian artifacts also produce large values of signal-to-noise ratio. The problem is, the question that we're asking is, is the data more consistent with Gaussian noise or more consistent with Gaussian noise plus the signal model? You are not asking, is the data more consistent with Gaussian noise plus some instrumental artifact? And it's very hard to ask that question because we don't know what the instrumental artifacts might look like so it's very hard to sort of ask this in a proper Bayesian way with priors on what we're looking for because we don't really know that. So we need to be a little bit more ad hoc about this. And the basic problem is we do need to be able to distinguish between these artifacts and real signals. Uh, and this really isn't a sort of trivial worry. Here's our first binary neutron star observation as we first saw it. 
Um, here's the Livingston detector. Here's the nice binary neutron star trace. And here is why we did not identify this in real time as a multi-detector candidate event. And this is why it took us four hours to reprocess the data and to alert astronomers that, need, that they need to point telescopes, because we had to get this out of the data. Um, for this particular case, at least in those few hours, we took a pretty brute force approach and zeroed out quite a significant stretch of the data just to be able to reprocess it. This was sufficient to find a binary neutron star on the sky. This is what was used to produce the sky map that we sent to astronomers. Um, so it was pretty brute force and ad hoc, but this is what we did. Uh, unfortunately, for much shorter signals, excising about a second of data is just going to mean that you've excised the black hole as well, and then you're not going to see anything. So this might be good as a sort of follow-up in this particular case, but in, this is not how we can distinguish these artifacts from real signals generically. To do this, we need tests to try to ask the question, is this data more consistent with a real signal or more consistent with an instrumental artifact? Um, now, the way this is done is actually one of the cases where the various pipelines do differ. Um, let me just walk through how PiCBC approaches this problem. So one of the first things that we do in PiCBC, um, and here, for example, is a, is a real signal, and here is an instrumental artifact. So what we say is, let's take our template waveform and split it up into 10 waveforms. We'll just take time bins, so split it into 10 chunks of time. Each of these chunks of time should contain a tenth of the waveform, where we define a tenth to be a tenth of the signal power. So some of these will be slightly longer than others. You sort of normalize by how loud the template is, the subtemplate is. The, at the start, they'll be quite long, and they'll get shorter as you get nearer to merger. Um, you then process the data, match filter the data, with each of these 10 subtemplates. If you had a signal-to-noise ratio of 20, you'd expect to get well, if you have to see, this, this goes as signal-to-noise ratio squared. So if you had a signal-to-noise ratio squared of 20 squared, which is 400, you would expect to get a signal-to-noise ratio squared of 40 in each of the sub-templates. Um, this adds in quadrature. So it, I can filter my data with each of these sub-templates. And if each of them gets a signal-to-noise ratio that's signal-to-noise ratio squared that's 40, th or with, with the expected errors, this is consistent with a real signal. If you have a glitch where maybe it's a delta function, then you might find that all of the signal power arises just for one of the templates, and only one of them. Right? It might be very localized in time. In that case, you might argue that this is pretty inconsistent with this being a real signal, and you can use this to veto. Um, and here's just an example of this running on, on these two examples. Here are my bins covering this particular template, and you can see that it sort of lines up pretty well. Um, these are not constructed mathematically. We've just drawn boxes on top of this and hope they kind of line up. Um, and here's, here's the same thing done for this particular artifact, and you can see that they, they don't line up particularly well with this, although, yeah, I know you can shift it to the left and it will probably line up better. Um, I'm just trying to make a, a, at least an illustration here. Um, so here's one of the, the techniques we use. Th this actually dates back, uh, even back to 2005, so, so this idea has been around a while and it's been very effective at making this distinction. Uh, a more recent attempt that we've tried is for higher mass binary black hole signals, we, we know that they tend to merge at sort of 100 hertz or a few hundred hertz, depending, we, depending on the mass, you know where this, the signal is going to stop. Um, a glitch might often extend to quite high frequencies. So if you have a signal that ends, say, here at, at somewhere like 100 hertz, you can then filter the data at higher frequencies using sine Gaussian waveforms. And if any of these pick up power, which they shouldn't if there's a real signal in the data, it might be an indication that you have a sort of uh, an instrumental artifact with power extending up to higher frequencies. So this is another test that we use. Um, another idea that we can use is to enforce consistency between various detectors. Um, and this is particularly powerful between the two, living, the, the two LIGO observatories because Basically, Hanford is oriented like this, and Livingston is oriented like this. So if you flip one round by 90 degrees, you pretty much get the other. That's not perfectly true. There's, there is a little bit of offset to this. But because they're oriented like this, for the most part, if Hanford sees something, Livingston will see the inverse. And nothing, it, it, and they'll see the same polarization, right? 
There is a slight difference to this, so Livingston might see a little, if Hanford <coughs> sees the plus polarization, Livingston might see a little bit of the cross polarization. But in general, it'll seem mostly minus the, hate, the plus polarization. Um, so what we can do is we can look to see what is the phase shift between the, Hanford, the signal observed in Hanford and the signal observed in Livingston, which we expect to be about minus pi, uh, uh, flipped, so a phase shift of pi. Um, we can also look at the time shift between these two observatories. The, these two things are correlated. And we can also look at the relative amplitudes as well, although I couldn't make a 3D plot to show that. Um, and then we can simulate a bunch of signals, determine where they would lie on this, what it becomes a 3D plane. And then if we observe potential signals, we can see do they lie in the regions where signals lie or do they not lie in the regions where signals lie. And you can then use this to distinguish between potential instrumental artifacts. Uh, and real signals. And by combining all of this together, we can create a ranking statistic where we take the signal to noise ratio and we multiply it by a function of these various tests that we've just applied to create what we call a, a reweighted, uh, or basically to create a, a, a chi squared measure here. Um, so in, in this case, what we can see is that the, the background signals here are shown in black. So, so these are um, instrumental artifacts. And the dots here are simulated signals um, that we've added to the, the, uh, the data. The squares are a particularly interesting one because these were added literally by shaking the mirrors, whereas the purple, the, the colored dots were added just in software. Um, and here's an actual, um, nature shook the mirrors for us as well. So here's some, some real events that also show up here. And you can see that these things are nicely separated. So, by looking at plots like this, we can then define our ranking statistic. We need a single number to determine is something interesting or is it not. And this can be given by, well, we, we retune this all the time and we, we're always changing exactly how we do this. But these curves here, these contours, show what we were using for this particular run. And basically as you move to the lower down and to the right, things become more significant, they become we believe, at, by our statistic, we are giving them more chance to be real. So things to the le lower and to the right are things that we think are more likely to be real signals. And this single ranking statistic is then, we effectively take all our things and we just put them in a list from most significant to least significant. Um, to do this, we must demand that a any potential signal is actually seen in at least two observatories, although we are trying to identify things that are also seen in one, although it's much more difficult to distinguish between the instrumental artifacts and real signals if only one detector is, is operating. So this statistic then combines together information from, from all of the detectors with all of these various statistics that we've combined and bring everything down to one number. So uh, at this point, we basically have a list of potential events. So we've gone through, we've match filtered the data in this detector, this blue detector, let's call this Hanford, and this red one, let's call it Virgo. Um, we look in each of the detectors for points where there's something interesting. We compute these various signal-based veto classifier measurements at each of the points. We look for cases where we've seen something in both of the detectors within the allowed light travel time between the two instruments. For example, here, um, our Hanford may be measured seven, six different events, and Virgo measured five, but there was only this one point here where they both observed an event at the same time, and this is the only thing that will be considered as a potential event. For this, we will compute our ranking statistic, and this will then go in a pot with all the other events that have been identified over the whole of the observing period. The final question is, are these real or not? E with all this ranking statistic, we still don't have a statistically meaningful measure of is this real or is it not? We've tried to do something that will put real signals to the interesting end and throw non-interesting things to the other end, but we still need to now compute a significance. Um, this would ideally be done by turning the universe off and operating our detectors with no gravitational wave signals present, which would allow us to measure a background rate. Um, unfortunately, it's hard to turn the universe off or to shield our detectors from gravitational wave signals because it doesn't work like that. So we have to try to measure a background 
while our detectors are still capable of observing gravitational waves. And this is a little bit tricksy. The way that we choose to do this, and there's slight differences between the, the different um, algorithms, but it all boils down to the same idea, is if I take my data from Hanford and my data from Virgo, I just add a time to all of the Virgo events. So if they were at 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, let's put them at 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8. I just, ran, just, just add some number to them in time. This time that I add has to be larger than the, time, the light travel time between the detectors because I have to move it by at least a, a reasonable amount. Um, but I do this time slide, and then I look to see, once I've applied this time shift, are any events now lining up? For example, these two things here, which was this one and this one, which of course are at quite different times, now end up to be shifted at the same time, and, and this forms uh, a coincident or a potential event in our background. We do this for many time slides, so we do it again. Um, here's a background event. Um, this has a problem because I, I try to do this hundreds of, actually we do this tens of millions of different time shifts, so we do this a lot. Um, from these tens of millions of different time shifts, I can ask a really clear question. Um, each of these time shifts should be equally likely to contain background events as my non-time shifted data. So if the loudest event that I see comes from my non-shifted data and not from any of my 10 million time slides, then that's a one in 10 million event. Um, there's no preference to the non-shifted data over the time slide. Um, if there's one louder event in the time slides, all 10 million of them, this will be a two in 10 million event, and so on and so on and so on. So I can use this to get a significance for my, my potential events in, in the foreground. The slight headache with this is that if I shift these around, at some point, my real gravitational wave signal is going to line up with these background events. So my background is going to be contaminated with gravitational waves lining up with real events. Um, and this is a difficulty in trying to deal with this. And it isn't entirely clear from a sort of statistical point of view what to do in these cases. In PyCBC, we tend to leave them in there and believe that this should be more significant than this, so it doesn't matter. And then if we've identified something as real, we'll just remove these two points from the data and then look for other signals that are there. So if you do have one really loud signal, you identify it, remove it, and then look for other signals underneath that. Um, but there's a few different ways of sort of how to deal with this potential problem. But it's really an unavoidable problem of us not being able to turn the universe off. Um, I should... At this point, also put in a slide about non-stationarity. This doesn't entirely fit nicely with the flow, but wherever I put it in, it kind of jars. The basic idea that we have to deal with the non-stationarity in our detectors is to basically keep remeasuring the noise curve, to keep remeasuring the power spectral density that we use in the match filtering. Um, we don't want signals in the data to appear in the measured power spectral density. So you don't want your power spectral density to include the signal and then just to sort of cancel it out. Uh, so we measure the power spectral density using something called Welch's method. We take 512 seconds of data. We split it up into a number of sets of a stretch of 32 seconds of data. Fourier transform meet each of these and basically take the average of the power in each of them. Um, if the noise curve does change on timescales less than this, it will impact our sensitivity. It will cause problems. Um, but it won't affect the validity of our significance measurement. Um, so there's often a lot of things in here which you can argue you might be able to make our instruments more sensitive or our search more sensitive potentially by doing X, Y, or Z. But I don't think any of it really affects the validity of our significance. So I think if, if we can sort of defend if we do say this is 1 in 10 million, I think that really is true. Maybe you could write a search that might be more sensitive, but I don't think, I think it's hard to challenge is our significance measurement valid, although of course I'm biased, so people should do that. With all of this together, we can produce our final result plots. Here's an example of the plot that we made for the first detection paper, the, the physical review letter. Um, this is our detection statistic that we had chosen to use at this point, um, which combines the signal-to-noise ratios from the two observatories and these various measurements of signal consistency. Um, and here's a number of events. This black line here shows the search background. This purple line here is the search background if you don't include gravitational wave events. All of this excess here is 
gravitational wave 150914 lining up with background events in the other instrument. This contains both Hanford shifted with Livingston and the Livingston trigger shifted with Hanford. So we, we saw both combinations. But the real event lies out here. So it's louder than all of this sort of junk here. So we can identify this as real. Then we can remove all this from the data. And then we can go back and look here. Was there something else? And this is actually LVT um, 15, 10, 12, as we saw it with the uh, original detection statistic. We have improved things since then. And, and this one lies a little bit further above the background now. Um, but this was the result. We can also see the uh, significance measure. So whether you're using the black or the gray curves, that's two, three, four, five sigma. Basically, if it's louder than five sigma, we, we give up and say, trying to compute significances out to say 57 sigma out here is, is very computationally expensive. And we start to run out of data. We can only do so many time slides. So we, we can't really compute a 57 sigma significance. But I mean, if you look to see the background's dropping like this and this event is over here, it, it's really not just at five sigma, it's way, way, way it's above five sigma. This is like 30 sigma or something like that. Um, finally, how do we validate the analysis? Basically, we simulate lots of signals. So we already have these waveforms. We can add them to the data, and we can perform a search to look for them and see if we recover them with uh, a very low false alarm rate. Um, here's a basic uh, idea of chirp mass, the, the, the total mass of the system as a function of the uh, signal-to-noise ratio in the least sensitive detector. Dark blue means we've seen it, and it's a clear detection. Red means we haven't seen it at all. And here's the sort of fuzzy reason, region where we go, Man, maybe this is real, maybe it's not. And we write interesting papers about subthreshold events. There's quite a clear turnaround between here where we see nothing and here where we see everything, um, which is really nice. Our background fall off is very steep because of the efforts that we've sort of put in to try to distinguish between um, these back instrumental artifacts and real signals. Um, and this is really sort of our, our validation that things are working as we like, as they should be. Uh, just to finish up, we don't only rely on match filtering. Um, as we've sort of already discussed, our match filtering searches do make a number of assumptions. And what if these assumptions are wrong? What if our waveform models are wrong? What if general relativity is wrong? Um, maybe we even have astrophysical sources that, that weren't expected, and so things like supernovae. Um, to search for things like this, we use um, what we call weakly modeled or, or burst searches. Um, Basic idea here, uh, and I'm not an expert, is to create Q transform spectrograms of the data at all times, look for features standing out from the noise, so things like this, and look for things that are consistent in both the observatories. So you've got two chirp-like looking things in two observatories. This was identified as a real signal. And actually, the first search to identify our first gravitational wave observation was one of these unmodeled search that actually was the first one to put a, a trigger in our database saying we think there was something interesting. So. Um, it's a nice demonstration that these methods really are a very powerful tool in terms of trying to observe binary black hole mergers, especially the types of things that maybe we don't expect. Um, so just to wrap up again, of course, we should always remember what's it all for. Um, here's just a picture of all the types of black holes that we've observed today and the binary neutron star. And as you heard already this morning, we've just published our first open public alert in 03, um, encouraging electromagnetic observers to search for what we believe to be a binary black hole. Um, so let me conclude. Gravitational wave astronomy is continuing to establish itself as a new field in astronomy. Um, we can, for the first time, observe black holes and neutron stars directly. Our current searches rely on match filtering with these ad hoc statistics to try to account for and deal with non-station non gaussianities in the data. Um, and we also use these unmodeled searches to, to catch the unexpected. Um, there's still a lot of work needed here. We still need to, we can still put effort into trying to improve these ranking statistics. Um, we also want to try to relax some of the assumptions I discussed earlier. And some of these things might become more important as we move towards more sensitive instruments with more broader sensitivity curves, especially when we look towards the third generation of gravitational wave astronomers. Um, broader sensitivity curves mean way more filter waveforms needed. And it's way harder to make the kind of assumptions that we spoke about at the start. Ignoring precession, not such a good idea when you need to search with this many waveforms. Um, so let me stop there. And if anyone has questions, there's also some references if anyone's interested. Thank you.